So I would like to welcome uh, Gaël. Uh, he's at home, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, Gaël is our uh, chief uh, economist uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, he is also a director for research at the French National Center for Scientific Research. He is a co-director of the Share Energy and Prosperity. And uh, he is uh, teaching uh, in uh, many universities, uh, Ecole des Ponts and uh, Institut d'études avancées uh, of uh, Nantes. Um, so, Gael mains um, uh, purpose and main uh, topics of work at the AFD is uh, twofold. Uh, first, uh, the, the contribution uh, has been made to the ed narrative uh, with, uh, you know, the approach of comments. Uh, uh, Gael inputs where to how to revisit uh, the way we are uh, implementing uh, ed. Uh, development aid and uh, taking into account more territories, uh, local actors, and uh, and uh, and the way the proprietary rights are considered. This is the first uh, uh, headings. And uh, Gail and his team is also very involved in uh, um, new uh, accountability of sustainable development and uh, developing a, a model, a modeling uh, which uh, helps uh, countries, partners, countries in uh, uh, apprehending the the the, the, the transition and the impact on the real and the financial sectors. Uh, Gail is also really interested in um, uh, questioning the way the, f the, the, the financing ways of, uh, of economies, uh, energy transition and the climate uh, uh, issue. Um, so a lot of uh, interest and today he will be uh, presenting a paper um, uh, explaining the, 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 the underways between um, uh, household debt, uh, growth and inequality. So you take a little bit the, the, the topic this morning during your introduction. I, I think you will shed new lights on the uh, relationship between fairness and uh, distribution and efficiency and uh, questioning and maybe uh, uh, claiming that it's not a trade-off. Uh, and um, and uh, you will have the floor for 20 minutes and uh, we will have a 10 minutes discussion. Thank you. C'est bon. Merci. So actually the work I'm going to present is a joint work together with uh, Matteo Scaracelli, who is a prof in mathematics actually and mathematical finance at the McMaster University in Toronto and who is also the deputy director of the Fields Institute. Um, and this work is part uh, of a huge research program that has been launched partly in the Chair Energy and Prosperity and here at the French Development Agency, which consists in, in a sense, renewing macroeconomic theory, macroeconomic analysis. The starting point being that, as you know, there are many problems with the standard CGE model, computable generative models, and also DSGE models. Just to quote a few people, you know that Paul Romer uh, published a paper in, 19, in uh, 2016 denouncing the way DSG models don't capture, let's say, anything relevant in terms of microdynamics. And there was also a paper by um, <coughs> Olivier Blanchard, the former chief economist of the IMF, um, stressing that DSG models, I quote, are seriously flawed. So in a sense, what I'm going to present is a way, is a contribution, a modest contribution to let's say, trying to rewrite macroeconomic theory. Um, when I discussed with Paul Romer on this issue uh, last year, when, when we met at the, at in Washington, he was still the chief economist of the World Bank at this time, he told me, well, you know, what we have to do is to go back to the solo model and to start ev everything uh, on the solo model. And in a sense, what I'm going to present you is tries to do this. And to, and to deal with the issue that was just mentioned by, uh, by Hélène, um, are we sure that we can just divide the political problem of having, let's say, growth and efficiency on the one hand, and fairness and distribution on the other hand? And as you will see, and as I said this morning, the main conclusion is that there is no such a dichotomy in the kind of analysis I'm going to present you. Um, the starting intuition is that um, private debt matters. I just want to stress this from the beginning because as you know, in many macroeconomic models, private debts don't play any role. Why? Because if there is someone in the economy who has a debt, a private debt, there must be a creditor somewhere. So the idea has been during a long time that on the aggregate, they cancel each other. So we should not bother. But we know, and this has been acknowledged by a number of people, let's say Krugman and many others since 2008 and the great financial crisis, that actually this is not true. Whether there are a lot of, not, uh, a lot of private debts or not, 
does matter. And here you have an example of that which shows this, which is the anti-correlation, the negative correlation between uh, the growth of private debt on the one hand and unemployment on the other hand. And the intuition for that is very easy. If you have more private debt, it means, it should mean on average that you have people borrowing money in order to invest more. If the private sector invests more, it means that it will create more jobs and therefore that will, there will be less unemployment. So the intuition is very clear for that and there is an empirical evidence for that. Another very striking chart here is the, the ratio between private debt and GDP in the UK since the end of the 19th century, 1880. And as you see, first remark, it's almost constant apart from the world wars during one century. So that's very surprising because as you know, it's very hard in microeconomics to find one ratio which remains constant for a country during one century. What does it mean? It means that during one century, in a sense, we had quotation mark, a good debt in the UK, in a sense that when someone was borrowing more money, this was in order to invest it in to create approximately the same added value, the same amount of new GDP, so that the ratio between private debt and GDP would remain constant. Okay? Now you see that since the Thatcher era, this is no more the case. You have big a big increase of the debt ratio, which means that, roughly speaking, since the financialization of the British economy, we are borrowing a lot of money, but this is bad private debt in the sense that it does not create as much GDP as the amount of money that has been borrowed, okay? The same picture for the US, and very interestingly enough, you don't even find the constant ratio during one century. Apparently, the US economy never succeeded in, in having good private debt. It always had bad private debt, big bubbles, big crashes, big bubbles, crashes. So, the question for this paper is, um, is there a link between private debt and inequality? The empirical evidence for that is not very abundant. There is one paper which makes the case, I mean, there are two papers very famous by Raghuram Rajan, Rajan 2010 and Joe Stiglitz 2011, who, sh who say, roughly speaking, we know, we, we guess that low wages feed debt of the middle class and the poor. And there is one very clear paper by Basilier and Eric 2017, which makes this case. There is a strong correlation between more private debt on the one hand and more inequality on the other hand. I guess my viewpoint is that the reason why there is no s such evidence, I mean, there is not a very large empirical evidence on this issue, especially in the global south, is due to the fact that many poor people do borrow money, but in the informal sector, in the informal banking sector. Just to give you an example, I know that in Mexico, you have a lot of poor people who are borrowing money, who have a lot of debt in the informal sector, in the Montes de Piedad and, and, and Spanish, and they pay a very large interest rate, something like 40% per year, which is just tremendous. But this is, you cannot see it in the statistics because this is purely informal banking sector. And nevertheless, it's clear that a, a poor household in the suburb of Mexico City, which has to pay 40% each year as an interest rate, has no chance to get out of the poverty trap. Okay, so that's why it seems to me, even though um, there are some empirical evidence, but not that much, um, we definitely have to, to work on this issue. Interestingly enough, also what Basili and Erico have shown is that there does not seem to be any relationship between um, uh, inequality and private debt of the production sector. So just for simplicity, I'm going to, to concentrate here on the issue of private debt of households. Um, so the main question is, uh, can we build an ethical framework where the channel between private debt and in income inequality can be studied? And as I said, this is part of a huge program, building a macroeconomic model uh, that we are uh, proposing to a number of southern countries at the French development agency. So we have a partnership now with uh, Colombia, Brazil, Ivory Coast, Tunisia, Morocco and Vietnam, where we co-construct these kind of macroeconomic model for the purpose of the political dialogue of this, with these countries. Now, what are the main properties of the model I'm going to present you? I was asked not to be too technical, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the equations. First of all, it's, it's a stock flow consistent model, which is important because the, the underlying mathematics of this model is a nonlinear dynamical system. So it's a truly dynamical system where you observe the trajectory of the economy out of equilibrium,
which means you have to make sure that at every point of time, stocks are really the outcome of the history of flows. A question which does not arise uh, in a purely equilibrium model, because there, there is no distinction between stocks and flows, since everything is at equilibrium. Second, uh, in this kind of model, you have several equilibria, long-run steady states, one of them being good, one of them, some of them being bad. The bad equilibria are characterized by depth deflationary trajectory, that is, the, the, the accumulation of private depth and the overhang of private depth leads to deflation and at the end to a collapse. <coughs> um, so as I said, uh, private debts do play a key role in the, in the whole story, and economic and monetary cycles are endogenous by construction. Um, the main assumptions are the following. You start with the Lotka Volterra dynamics. Um, so this is essentially the, the main intuition of the model you have here, quoted here by Goodwin, Kass Stiglitz, Akelov Stiglitz, Van der Plug, etc. So you start with the Lotka Volterra dynamics between the wage share and the un unemployment rate. The idea is very simple. Suppose you have growth. If you have more growth, this means that most probably you will have more employment. If you have more employment, this means that most probably it will be easier for the workers to bargain for higher wages. Simple microeconomic argument. This means that normally, most probably, wages will, in will increase more rapidly, so that normally, most probably, the wage share, that is the share of wages into in the GDP, will increase. But if the wage share increases too rapidly at a certain point of time, investment will probably decrease because profits are reducing. If investment decreases, you have less growth tomorrow. If you have less growth, you have less investment. Less investment means less employment. So you have an endogenous cycle due to the fact that you have a, a prey, which is uh, the wage share, and a predatory, which is the unemployment rate. Okay. To this very simple, simplistic dynamics, what we do is that we add uh, uh, a Phillips curve, a short-run Phillips curve. I do know that there, there are a lot of debates in macroeconomic theory on the existence or not of the Phillips curve, but there is much less debate on the existence of a short-run Phillips curve. So this is what we, what we need here. And using these two ingredients, that's the model. Very simple. So in a nutshell, it's a solo model with private debt, a short-run Phillips curve, and heterogeneous households. Just one word, we, we just focus on productive capital, so we don't have a no embracing uh, definition of capital due to the Cambridge controversy. And uh, so these are the seminal papers on which this work is based. One word on the micro foundation. We don't have microeconomic foundation. Why? Because of the celebrated Zon and China Mantel de theorem of general equilibrium theory from the 70s, which tells you that even though we may we might have perfectly rational households at the microeconomic level, when you aggregate them, you may have emerging phenomena. That is, the aggregate demand has no reason to be analogous to the demand of your household. Which means that already in the 70s, we knew that the representative household assumption does not make sense from a purely orthodox general equilibrium viewpoint. So that's why we take this seriously and we say, well, let's just empirically estimate the aggregate demand, the aggregate investment function, the Phillips curve, and that's it. If we want to go further and to dig into the micro foundation, my opinion is that what we should do is to have an agent-based model, but this is not done so far. <coughs> So this is the stock flow consistent matrix of the, of the model. So for in the first, to begin with, you have households, you have firms, then banks. I don't have time to go into the details. You can plunge into it. Here you see that um, households have some consumption. They spend it. This is uh, an, an income for the firms, etc. Okay, And households have here some wages. And these, the, the firms have to pay, etc. Um, as I said, you have a very, sh uh, very simple short-run uh, Phillips curve. The inflation dynamics is just the standard dynamics where you have prices relaxing towards the unitary production cost times the markups. That is, there is some imperfect competition on the on the um, the uh, production, the consumption good market. Just for simplicity, we assume that the capital to output ratio is constant. In other words, we are doing as if the production function was a Leontief production function. This we can get rid of, and there is a student over there who is working on the extension of this work with a CES production function. And that's it. You do a little bit of algebra, and you end up with a 
a, a three-dimensional dynamical system, which is non-linear, but which is actually economically trivial. What this model tells you is that the wage share will rise if wages, the wage rise, sorry, exceeds growth in the labor productivity. Employment rises if economic growth exceeds the sum of population and labor productivity growth. And the private debt ratio rises if the rate of growth of debt exceeds the rate of growth of GDP. So in a sense, these are economic truisms, and these are just the math that say exactly this, that tell exactly the same story. What are the properties of this model? Uh, in general, there are three long-run steady states in this model. One of them is locally unstable, so we can forget it immediately. One of them is an equilibrium a la solo, so that's actually the reminiscent equilibrium that you had in the solo model. So along this model, you have that the growth rate of the economy is just equal to the growth of labor productivity and population. The golden rule is satisfied. The employment rate converges to the Nehru employment rate in the sense of Tobin. And it's easy to see that you have a long-run trade-off between inflation and employment. But you can also have a second equilibrium, which is a catastrophic deflationary equilibrium, where growth goes to zero asymptotically and employment grows to zero asymptotically. Both equilibria cannot be locally stable, not at the same time. Uh, sorry, both equilibria can be locally stable, but not at the same time. And it turns out that monetary policy, that is the interest rate, the short-run interest rate on the private debt, does have an impact on the long-run stability of the equilibria. Which means that monetary policy does play a role even in the long run. Money is non-neutral, even in the long run. Um, so here you have an example of a simulation. The economy starts here, for those who are here, here, and then there are cycles. It converges to this long-run state. Here you have the employment rate. Here you have the wage share. Okay. Here you have another picture of the same trajectory. Here you have the, uh, the GDP growth, which is exponential. That's a purely theoretical example. And here you have the various uh, other, uh, other the variables, so employment rate, inflation, debt, etc. And as you see, there are endogenous cycles. But, it, but as I said, you may have a situation where the bad equilibrium is stable, and it's the unique one which is stable. You may have a situation where the good equilibrium is stable, and in between, there are parameters of the, of the model where there is no equilibrium which is stable. You just have limit cycles. So the economy, even in the long run, will just cycle, and it will never converge to an equilibrium. So this is an example. Okay? Um, and of course, you have also situations where you converge to the bad equilibrium, which is here. So zero, zero wages, zero employment, and zero production. <coughs> now, if we want to go a little bit further, we have to refine this model, which is very simple, and to distinguish between the households, within the households, between investors, that is those households which are earning money from the capital, and workers which are just earning money from the labor. If we do this, then we have a, a, a stock flow matrix which is a little bit more complicated. Now you have a column for workers, a column for investors. What investors do is that they receive the dividends of the private sector, including both the firms and the banks. They consume it. And workers, they receive, quotation mark, just the wages here. Okay, These are the wages and these are the, this is the rental rate of capital and these are the dividends of the banking sector. Now, if you do this, you end up with a slightly more complicated dynamical system, which has four dimensions instead of, of three. Again, you have the wage share, the employment rate, but now you have the debt ratio of the workers and the debt ratio of the investors. The long-run analysis is essentially the same as before. So you have many equilibria, as I said. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Um, you can study the local stability. And it turns out that the bad equilibrium is characterized by the following property. Every path that leads to the bad equilibrium, the deep debt deflationary equilibrium, is such that inequality of income between workers and investors explodes to infinity. Whereas, on the contrary, every path that leads to the good equilibrium, to the solo equilibrium, is such that inequality between workers and investors is bounded. In other words, according to if you believe in this kind of analysis, if you see an economy where in income inequality between workers and investors is increasing, then you might be on the track of a very bad long-run equilibrium. So this might have a debt deflationary impact 
on the long run. And if you want to have more growth, this means that you have to drive the economy out of this bad basin of attraction, out of this the, the neighborhood of this bad attractor, towards the neighborhood of the good attractor where inequalities remain bounded. In other words, inequality, I mean fairness and efficiency go hand in hand. Either you have efficiency and fairness, that's the good equilibrium, or you have neither efficiency nor fairness, that's the bad equilibrium. Okay? And as far as I know, this is the first time we have a full-blown analytical framework where you can see this at work. Okay? Now, what is the channel? The channel is very easy to understand. If you have more inequalities, the poor people, let's say the workers, are getting poorer, and which means that they have to borrow more money in order to have some income. If they borrow more money, they have to pay an interest rate, which here, for just for simplicity, is non-zero. And then the investors are getting this debt service as a profit of the banking sector. So actually, having more debt on the side of workers is a way to transfer wealth from the poor to the rich. Okay, private debt is a way to is a channel to transfer money from the poor to the rich because the poor have to pay an interest rate on the debt, and this interest rate is a profit for the investors. Okay. And therefore, this is a self-fulfilling cycle where the poorer the, the, the workers are, the poorer they're getting because they have to pay an interest rate on their private debt. Okay? Uh, so again, examples of the same story, as I said, you have good and bad equilibria and, and limit cycles. Now, some properties, and I will stop here, properties of the long-run inequality in this kind of model. So, um, as I said, when, whenever the economy is moving towards the Solovian equilibrium, the good equilibrium, then income inequality remains constant. Otherwise, inequality rises uh, in an unbounded way. Now, you remember probably the, the very famous equation, R bigger than G plus I, I is just inflation, so sometimes I is forgotten, but of course, if everything is nominal, you need, you need I, which has been made famous by, by Piketty's book, um, and with the claim that if R is bigger than G, you remember, uh, then inequalities are going to increase uh, in an unbounded way. So it has been proven, and that's very easy by Ashimolu and Robinson, that actually R bigger than G does not imply that inequalities increase. Um, and it has been shown by Gauss from the IMF that empirically you see countries where R is bigger than G without any increase of inequality and vice versa. Okay. So the link, the, the idea that R bigger than G implies a rise of inequality is wrong. But here in our model, it turns out you have some relationship with inequality in the sense that R bigger than G plus I is a necessary condition for the local stability of the bad equilibrium. In other words, if R is not bigger than G, you have no chance to read the bad equilibrium. So no chance to have an unbounded increase of inequality. Okay. So in a sense, here we recover the intuition that was behind Piketty's claim that R bigger than G implies uh, a rise of inequality. And second, uh, you remember that the second law of capitalism in, in Piketty's book was that beta, the ratio between capital and GDP, if this increases, let's say because GDP does not increase sufficiently rapidly, then there is a rise of inequality. Okay. Here, in our model, it turns out that if you have this property, that is, the ratio of capital over output increases, then the basin of attraction, that is, the set of points from which you will converge to the bad equilibrium, so the basin of attraction of the bad equilibrium grows. Its geometry increases. Its volume or its surface increases. Okay? So this, again, is a way to recover the basic intuition that if beta increases, then you have more inequality. Okay? Um, another property of this kind of model is that you have this equation which simply says it's very easy. Profit here is always equal to investment plus consumption plus the change in the debt, the private debt of workers, plus the service of the debt of the workers, minus the service of the debt of the, the firms, minus the rental rate of capital. Okay. So this is reminiscent of an old, uh, of an old, uh, let's say, theorem of Kaliski, which says that, you know workers consume what they earn here, but investors earn what they consume and invest, and the profit is always equal to the consumption of the investors plus investment. 
plus, this was not clear in the work by Kaleski, the profit is also made by the, of the change in the, the depth of the workers and the service of the depth of the workers. And as I said, the more the, the, more the workers have debt, the more profitable it is for the investors. Okay? Now, of course, if you have the debt of firms, which is much higher than the debt of the workers, you may have an incentive to have a very low interest rate because, look here, if you have a, a high interest rate, small r, then of course a very high debt of the firms will induce a very low profit. And probably this is the case in the European Union today, where, as you know, firms have a huge, a lot of debt, and of course they are putting a lot of pressure on the banking system, and especially on the ECB, so that the ECB would keep very low interest rates, because otherwise this is going to be negative. Okay? Last, two, two last remarks. In the, in the book by Piketty, um, it's claimed that an efficient path were, as I said, R as bigger than J leads to ever-growing inequality. Here it's exactly the opposite. The more efficient you are, the less inequality you must have. Okay? So there is no, as I said, once again, there is no trade-off between inequality and, and efficiency. And the last remark, which I think is very important for the ecological shift, is the following. As, you, as I said, uh, along the good equilibrium, the growth, rate is ex the, gro the growth rate is exactly equal to the rate of growth of productivity, labor productivity, plus the rate of growth of the population, labor force, exactly as in the, the solo model. But if this is near to zero, as it might be the case in the coming decades, that's the main topic of the secular stagnation, then this does not prevent the good equilibrium from being stable. We may converge to a good equilibrium even though we have very f low potential growth, or even we are close to secular stagnation. St secular stagnation is not a problem in order to converge towards the good equilibrium. So there was this question was raised by Tim Jackson in a paper in 2015 in the context of the ecological shift. Do we need growth in order to implement the ecological shift? And Tim at this time said, no, we don't. Here you have the same kind of conclusion. You don't need to have a growth, actually, or very little, uh, to reach the, the, the solo equilibrium. Um, some further work for those who are interested in. Of course, this raises the question of which public policy works better in order to reduce inequality and efficiency, since they go hand in hand. First question. Second question, we, we might want to introduce default and collateral in the whole story, as I did in a previous paper. This is not done so far. A third question, of course, if you replace the Leon CF production function by a CS production function or by a Puticlay production structure, what's happening? That's an open question so far. Um, of course, again, here this is an entirely myopic dynamic, so there is no expectations, even less rational expectations. So what's happening if you introduce expectations into the dynamics? Um, Another big question is also endogenous money creation. As you know, the Bank of England has stressed in 2014 that actually money creation is endogenous in our economies. It's not exogenously given by the central bank. It's endogenously given by the demand for credit. Okay. Now, can you have this kind of story into this model? The answer is yes, but we have to do it. Um, of course, the link with climate change is also an open question. We have one version of this model where there is a climate backloop and we can study the dynamics of the world trajectory taking into account the impact of climate change. <coughs> there is, of, of course, the question of the energy transition towards renewables. Is the fact that inequality are growing a problem for that? Does it help? In which sense? Uh, this is a paper uh, started with uh, Luis Lushkin. As I said, if you insist in having some micro disaggregation, most probably, I believe, we have to run some agent-based simulations. This is not done. And, of course, there is also the big question, which is uh, we know that the capital accumulation equation is wrong. It's not true that investment today induces immediately an increase of capital. You need some time for that. And sometimes you have a delay of, let's say, 10 years between the very time you invest and the moment the infrastructure is working. But this introduces a delay in the differential equation, which is very hard to deal with. 
So first of all, you, you see hop purification disappearing. And second, you have to deal with an integral differential equation, which is much more difficult to, be difficult to study than a standard differential equation. And we'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gail. So I think we have time for 10 minutes discussion. Um, so I propose to take a few questions. Andrea. I teach microeconomics. Oh, oh, I teach microeconomics. Now, your model starts from a very strong assumption that uh, increased credit will lead to increased activity, increased investment, uh, more jobs, and so on and so forth. Well, all the data basically show that the, uh, an increasing volume of the credit is not re going to the real economy, but it's going to, to financial transaction. So they don't exit the financial sector, and they stay there. So that, uh, perhaps you should make this distinction. So the, because I mean, for sure, if you have credit to manufacturing and uh, uh, the construction sector and so on and so forth, this may have the effect you now describe it. So, and the question is, that what, what is the proportion of credit that goes to the banks who are producing synthetic indexes, and then that the collateral, I mean, all this, and we have had a huge crisis, which has set back the European economy and the American economy for 10 years, and now who may set back the Chinese economy. So now there is this big debate about the Chinese uh, uh, credit bubble. So, uh, so perhaps uh, one suggestion would be take out the good part of the credit and throw away the one which remains within the financial sector. Now, then I'm surprised that you don't mention, uh, actually, perhaps you mentioned it, but uh, you didn't mention it. There is a very interesting paper by uh, Kumov and Rancière, produced in the IMF, I think. And, uh, and then basically the credit, I mean, of course, in a long-term solo type model, uh, then you don't look at short-term fluctuations. But, uh, <coughs> Uh, the key point is that uh, if there is any shock, and there might be a shock, which moves the distribution in an adverse way, so in favor of the capital owners, then what will they do, these people? Well, they may invest in the financial sector and receive rents, or they may invest in manufacturing. And so if they invest in manufacturing, then the workers go back uh, as happily as before. Otherwise, they have to borrow. This is one of the major problems <laughs> which has occurred in the US and in Europe. So they accumulate that, and then if monetary policy, if the interest rate, they go up for any reason, then you have a financial crisis. So, um, and finally, I'm, I'm most surprised that you haven't mentioned uh, Schiller, who is a Nobel Prize winner, winner and, uh, mm, and Minsky. Minsky basically studied all the, basically the cycles in which uh, Altogether, the, you know, the, the role of expectations and perceptions, and, and so this is a very unstable sector. And one of my maestro, uh, Joe Stieglitz, God bless his name, as uh, probably one of yours as well, you know. So basically, he, he says that the financial sector is not like the selling shoes because there is herd behavior. There are all sorts of uh, market sentiments which is very difficult to model. Solo is straightforward. With some credit to the real economy, then you are right. But the world is not all like that. Huh? I cannot agree more than 100% with you. Um, so let me just comment on your question. So here there is no financial sector, just for simplicity. There is a paper by Mateus, my co-author, um, which deals without inequality, without the issue of inequality, which deals with adding to this kind of dynamics uh, financial sector where people can speculate and, and make money with, uh, with purely speculative behavior. And of course, this makes the bad equilibrium much more stable. So this increases the basin of attraction of the bad equilibrium. So this makes it much more difficult to reach the good equilibrium. Um, I totally agree with you that one thing I should mention it that we have to do is to introduce uh, a financial sector into this kind of model to see, uh, in a sense, to duplicate the narrative of, of Michael Kumov and Romain Rancière, um, which was, in a sense, that financial markets have increased inequality. I totally agree with you. So we haven't done it. We have to do it. Um, so on this issue, just one remark. The paper by uh, uh, Michael and, and Romain is a DSG model. 
So it has all the problems of the SGE models, so, uh, but it's not a, a way to say the paper is not interesting. It's very interesting. But you know, the message is, I think, is very correct. That is, financial markets have contributed to, uh, to uh, inequalities, and the way to prove it, it seems to me, have, has to be improved, but that's a technical issue. On this issue also, one point which it seems to me is very important is uh, it's another paper um, by uh, Nicolas Boulot, a French mathematician, which shows the following, and that's very surprising the first, one, the first time you see it. Um, suppose that financial markets are fair games. Of course they are not, but suppose they are fair games. That is, I, I speculate with, with Helen, with some money, and each time we flip a coin and there is half-half probability that one of us wins, and that's the way uh, the financial markets, uh, market goes. And of course, the Brownian motion hypothesis re I mean, keeps something of this idea, because the Brownian motion, as you see, as you know, is entirely neutral, uh, can, can go to the left or to the right. So it's, in a sense, the, the, the simplest version of the Brownian motion is to flip a coin, okay? Now, suppose we play this game, um, then Nicolas has proven that if you wait sufficiently long, there will be just one guy who owns everything. So, inequ so equality of chances leads to the highest inequality of income. So that's very interesting. Um, so it's it's a it's a way to prove that financial markets, even if they were they were perfectly neutral and, and fair, would lead necessarily to higher inequality. And it's also a, a big challenge for us because it means that we have to go much deeper into the analysis of social justice than just equality of opportunity. Um, my, my viewpoint is that at the end of the 90s, in Western Europe, we have adopted, at least social democracy has adopted the idea that social justice you know, is an old concept and we should just deal with equality of opportunities. Um, and, still, and for instance, Anthony Giddens, the sociologist, has played a big role in introducing this idea uh, which was already in the book by John Rawls, you know, uh, Theory of Justice, but Rawls complemented the equality of opportunity with the principle of difference, the maximum principle. So what Giddens did, in a sense, was to forget the maximum principle and to say, well, we should just focus on uh, equality of opportunity. Um, so what, what Nicolas has proven is that equality of opportunity may lead to the highest inequality of income that you can think of. So what I plan to do is to try to introduce these kind of ideas into this kind of model, but I haven't done it. Um, now, on Minsky, of course, I should have mentioned him, because it's clear that Hyman Minsky is the inspiration of all this literature dealing with the instability of capitalism. So it's clear that uh, I should have done it. You're right. Other questions? Yes, hi, uh, Anne-Sophie Robillard from uh, IRD. I used to be a CG person, so I'm happy to see that things are, are changing. <laughs> I know they are, but uh, I'm also a, a micro simulation person, so I'm a bit um, uh, frustrated by the way inequality here is reduced to a labor against capital. And so I, I expect that in, uh, uh, that in, uh, in another version of models, it would introduce at least human capital to take, uh, to take into account uh, uh, the issues uh, related to that. And sure, I definitely. was going to ask the question about the uh, link with climate change, obviously, obviously, and carbon emissions, but I see that it's, it's in your program. Yeah, yeah, sure. So if you want to join us to work on this issue, you are welcome. Um, no, that's a huge work, so definitely, no, I agree with you, we have to do it, but you know, um, there are just 40, uh, 48 hours a day, so... Uh, yes. How about government debt? Is there a, a room for uh, extending the same stuff and perhaps you can reach a conclusion where uh, up to a certain uh, threshold and then becomes bad. Yeah, sure, Th that's a very good question. We haven't done it, so that's why I, I, I put it in the, in the first place. Um, actually, we have done it in, in one version of the model where inequality are not modelized, but just the, the trade-off between the wage share and unemployment. Uh, this has been done by Matteo Scarcelli, my co-author. Um, so in a sense, it's you can, what you can prove is that <coughs> by implementing in a clever way uh, public taxes and public spending, you can destabilize the bad equilibrium. You can drive the economy out of the, the neighborhood of the bad equilibrium every time the economy is attracted by it and put it in the basin of attraction of the good equilibrium. 
But you see, this, this opens a new area of research in terms of public policy, which is how can the state drive an economy towards the good basin of attraction? Same story for climate change. If there are some you know, areas where you don't want to go, because this is too, this will coincide with too much greenhouse gas emissions, then you have to do some viability theory, some viability analysis to drive the economy in the right path. Okay, so this you can do, this is optimal control theory in terms of dynamical systems. Um, we are just beginning to do this, to perform this analysis. But of course, it's fascinating, very interesting, and opens a new, a new area of research. Of course, you are very far away from just saying that the state you know, should be a minimal state uh, taking care of the police, and that's it. I think uh, we will conclude. Uh, thank you very much, Gahel, and uh, you thank have you. a full, uh, fruitful agenda of research ahead, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.